Umis think you have it hard? Well, the Orcs have the proper tough jobs, and we'll smash the stupid Umis to pieces, and anything else that messes with the Orcs. Orcs bigger than your average humanoid of the galaxy, coupled with being angrier, smashier, and far more randomly violent, generally open to casual brutality beyond most of your more, let's say, measured or at least focused 40k entities, and while the galaxy as we know is a place filled to the brim with acts of extreme violence, the uncommon thing about the orcs is their generally sunny disposition about such matters. Seeing the person next to you wailing as they're torn in half, leaving you showered in blood, would for several of the races in the darkened future give at least pause for concern, more likely running screaming in terror, but for the orcs they would likely feel invigorated and positively encouraged to charge even more enthusiastically at their enemy. Orcs tend not to share the same concerns as other races with regard to the bigger picture concerning their race's general achievements, their failings, or overarching collective strategy. To put it simply, Orcs just don't really care about what's happening in the wider scheme of things. The result is that Orcs generally have one of the most objectively carefree lives compared to almost all others, save for perhaps the Tyranids, for who the concepts of fear, worry and disappointment or frustration even are surely completely absent. So with this in mind you have to understand that it's really quite difficult to compile a worst or best jobs list for the orcs, because you could generally consider they are happy for most of the time, and the worst jobs will more likely entail anything very mundane or that leaves them out of battle. Strangely though, when you think about it, orcs often seem to generally love whatever they're doing, so this really makes it quite difficult to assign any kind of excessively negative or positive association with roles for them. Much more so than other races where the concepts of ego and social impact are far more apparent and understood. Also, in regards to orc culture, I'll include these sub-races like the Gretchen, the Grots, and Snotlings, the Snots. So we approach this with perhaps more the perspective of someone subjectively outside looking in, say an Imperial Xenos scholar perhaps, who could assign some more humanistic perceptions. As always, if you think I've missed an option to include here, tell me below, and we can look at it in a follow-up best worst video. First up, a big guns grot. Now while orcs as we know will run towards their enemy with glee and blood curdling screams, they often will still use field artillery to back up their onslaught. These massive shooty guns are referred to accurately as big guns. Entertainingly hazardous to their operators as much their enemy, they fall into three main descriptions. Cannon, with a K, being a large bore shell of either a fragmentation or solid slug for smashing enemy armour. Lobbers are more akin to a big mortar or sometimes even using a catapult with an explosive payload fired high to then land deep in enemy lines dealing maximum damage. Or the stranger Zap with two Zeds gun, which fires a large arc of electrical discharge into the targeted enemy. Operating any orc technology is usually with a fair amount of risk, but for the grots operating big guns, the nature of their powerful munitions means the chances of something being fairly unpleasant, as and when it goes wrong, are significantly increased. The zap operator, for example, will deliver an electrical discharge relative to the nerve of the grot firing the weapon. The firepower increases the longer the lever for delivery is held down and continues to increase the power of the shot. Too short and the weapon will do little more than spurt and crackle, and too long and the chances of it overloading and disintegrating its operator increases. Cannon operators though face the additional hazard of having to retrieve or inspect rounds, which could involve reaching down on a large enough cannon, perhaps climbing inside the barrel. Depending on the design of the cannon, this could be a dud round that needs replacing, or it could be a shoddy machine which caused a light strike not triggering the shell's primer. The likelihood of the grot's operating mates resisting the temptation to try to repeatedly still fire the round, potentially shredding or segmenting their fellow operator in the process, is slim, not when much hilarity is to be had for those not risking life and limb. Even avoiding such catastrophic injury doesn't allow big gun operators to avoid their disabling effects, as the firing of such massive weapons will quickly deafen its gunners, leaving them to use very basic sign language of pointing and waving to get by, which rarely extends to any permanent form of more elaborate communication. On top of all this, big gun operators are unlikely to see with real clarity how effective the rounds they deliver to an enemy are, not with any grisly details, and so this coupled with the debilitating effects of the weapons lead them to be a role which few would opt for, and even for a passionate orc or Gretchen it's really hard to put a positive spin on this beyond helping other orcs deal nasty damage to their foe. 
Up next would be experimenting, or an unnecessary surgery test subject. Now, orcs are generally extremely tough physiologically. They heal fast and are capable of suffering extreme anatomical trauma that would either physically or mentally overwhelm most other mortal races. As with much of what orcs do when it comes to medical treatment, this is not a studied field. Orcs do not study and learn how to repair physical damage, and more often than not, it's probably unnecessary. Instead, some orcs may simply lean instinctively toward wanting to and being capable of more effectively performing surgery and body modifications on other orcs. In some cases where an orc has been heavily wounded in a fight with another orc perhaps and is still deemed worthy of salvaging. A dock or pain boy or perhaps later to be designated as a bad dock may attempt some form of restorative surgery or more likely adaptation and installation of some kind of cybernetic body augmentation. These kind of restorative procedures are at best pretty crude, and where humans may use some kind of careful stitching of a wound or internal surgery, orcs would just use a staple gun, which sounds pretty nasty, but bear in mind orcs' heads can be detached live from their bodies for some time and can even be transplanted onto another body if done before death. Worse than just the generally rough and ready medical repairs, there are test subjects for docs. Like most other elements of orc culture, like mechs, who love to just try out whatever they think would be a good idea to make a vehicle or mechanical more powerful in speed or firepower, a doc may decide that he's had a great idea for how to make an orc work better. This could be through an orc who was rendered temporarily unconscious, or one who has been brought in for medical repairs. They could have been perhaps persuaded that the doc's idea would definitely 100% make them stronger, bigger, or generally more capable at smashing their rivals. These unnecessary surgeries are often pretty horrific. Anesthetic, what's that? It's certainly more in the service of satisfying a doc's curiosity than they are about whatever end goal they were hoping to achieve. They certainly wouldn't have been tested out in any careful fashion and are far more of a spur of the moment or improvised idea, a light bulb moment, which will often result in unpleasant injury, death or extreme disfigurement than it would any positive achievement for an orc. Still though, in terms of positive or negative, some orcs would probably not care too much considering that they would die while undergoing whatever horrible surgery the doc was attempting, and again, on the off chance that the doc was actually able to achieve his random inspirational modification, the orc in question would certainly consider the unpleasant sawing, cutting and spurting to be worthwhile. But for those left ruined and more incapable than before, even by orc standards, due to the doc's surgery, it's hard to see how they could walk away feeling good about their situation, unless they were simply just too stupid and were persuaded by the doc that it was all a fantastic success. Not to mention when it comes to scars for orcs, the more severe the better, as they're seen as a mark of toughness and deserve respect. Except this usually is reserved for battle scars, but still, surviving horrifically brutal surgery has to be worth something. An orc commando is an orc who prefers to use what qualifies as cunning and stealth for an orc. They are infiltrators and saboteurs and prefer to ambush their enemy than they do run charging at it screaming for blood. This unconventional nature means they're often viewed suspiciously and with a relative amount of disdain by other orcs, as much of their behaviour seems to run counter to much of orc culture. Commandos will creep up on unsuspecting enemies, stabbing, slashing and slitting enemies' vulnerable areas before they can fight back, as well as strangely targeting munitions and resources in a seemingly unusually focused manner for an individual orc unit. Because other orcs often view those who end up in the commando role as being time wasters or just plain cowards who refuse to face their enemy head on with all guns blazing, commandos will often exile themselves temporarily or sometimes permanently so as to avoid having to engage in social interaction with others who would likely give them a hard time. Commandos are often even able to read other languages, as the orcs who end up in this role usually are of a higher intelligence than your average orc. Although to be fair, that's not an especially high bar to rise above. Still, how they are able to do this is difficult to understand. Likely, as with all orc traits, it's a genetic and instinctive one, and they're somehow able to see patterns and systems within written language, enabling them to learn and more easily replicate languages of other races that they encounter. They then will turn this to their advantage in carrying out their sabotage or planned ambushes. While they may be largely shunned by their fellow orcs for doing that sneaking about stuff, any war boss worth his teeth will recognise the commandos as being extremely useful assets that make for a far better outcome for any battle. Still, the role of a commando has to rank as one of the best or worst roles depending on how you look at it. 
For the commandos themselves, it's possible they feel a bit miffed about missing out on the goings-on of orc culture, but on the other hand, their disposition probably means that general goings-on go fairly against the grain for them, and so, as with most orc roles, they aren't probably that bothered one way or the other. On the more negative side of the coin though, having to put yourself in a self-imposed exile, as well as your skills and achievements generally being completely underappreciated by your peers, has to be somewhat of a negative, even if you're just getting on with your own way of doing things. When orcs have no ongoing conflict, they need somehow to entertain themselves, and as with most things, this means finding some way to incorporate savage violence. It's basically a necessity. So orcs will often arrange pit fights, either against native predators on whatever world they happen to have built up some sort of established town or city or control of a world itself, and they will of course fight against each other as well. This may also lead to a war boss's authority being challenged by a rival. Now these pit fights are of course popular as they entertain the whole warband, and so again it's a pretty hard one to argue that this is really a worst job in the strictest sense, but as I said, we have to perhaps just put anything which is not fighting in battle as a negative from maybe an outside perspective, because truly from an orc's point of view, they're going to struggle really to have too much of a negative or even strongly positive perspective on almost anything they do. Now, pit fighting can also be used to settle grudges and serves as whatever loose sense of law, not really law, the orcs use to guide their daily life. In terms of is it a best or worst task to have, pit fighting could be at its worst that an orc loses their face or head to a rival in an arguably pointless one-on-one -on -one battle, whereas he could have done the same thing while smashing some filthy humanoids in the process. But far more likely it's seen by them as a glorious positive, whereby they contribute to the further social status of a rising orc, or by gaining increased respect and power themselves by smashing his rival's head in or ripping it off. Not all the objectively bad roles to play in orc society involve pain and or having your head smashed in. There is actually some social sniping that occurs even in orc society. Most orcs live together, rely and thrive upon this cooperative, albeit somewhat grating symbiosis. Orcs, Gretchen, Snot, Squigs, it's all by design, yet some exist on the periphery of orc society. And this can be optional, like orc commandos, and to a lesser extent, flyboys and speed freaks. Basically anything that's outside the realms of good art fighting may be shunned, and while orcs who flaunt their violence and strength of smashiness to other orcs are celebrated and an integral part of orc culture, in order for a warboss to carry out a campaign, he may wish to acquire more tech and firepower. One source of this is the orc subculture of freebooters, essentially pirates and merchants who care a lot more about shiny things and wealth accumulation. Orcs like freebooters who love to show off their accumulated wealth and general swagger are not appreciated by most orcs. And this by no means is to say that all freebooters are showy posers who want to rub their accumulated wealth in the face of a clan. Some are fairly business oriented merchants and straight up pirates. Some though definitely enjoy nothing more than telling their fellow clanmates that they are considerably, considerably richer than you, and this general swaggering arrogance will be thinly tolerated by fellow orcs, and persistently shoving their wealth and success in the face of others will likely result in them being quite quickly kicked out of the clan on their arses. More than likely by the war boss themselves, who couldn't tolerate the thought of some lowly knob having weapons or tech bigger and more impressive than himself. The humiliation of being booted out though will be fleeting for most flash gits, who are probably still too blinded by their superior wealth to care, and will undoubtedly end up signing aboard the local freebooters, desperate to find, as quickly as possible, a new source of teeth. While these flashy gits, as with most orcs, care little for the disdain and opinion of others, it's still pretty damning to be out on your ass for behaving like a flashy git. Snots definitely get the rough end of the stick in basically everything they're designated to do, but as always with the orc kind, they don't seem to be too fussed about it. They are the lesser form of orc, smaller than a Gretchen, and they're usually only about half a metre in height. Their general weakness and ineffectiveness at any combat means they occupy the lowest levels of orc society. Snotlings will have the lowliest of tasks like fungus growing and of course livestock management. Livestock for the orcs means squigs, a wholly unpleasant creature crammed with teeth and generally featuring a behaviour of biting whatever is nearest at all times. 
Snotlings have something for an affinity for working with squigs, again likely by design, and so not too many of them end up being bitten in half by the squigs that they manage. Nonetheless, it's hardly a task one would opt for out of choice. Squigs being hazardous to handle, some are bred as a food source, cooked or raw, and others are ammunition. Some might be strapped up as mobile IEDs, and some aptly titled face eaters are a heavily toothed variety which are used for orc entertainment in the always hilarious who can rip whose face off first contest. So you may imagine that for a snotling, handling these and other like the flesh eater squigs is somewhat of a hostile work environment. Each day might be your last and you may find yourself writhing around on the floor without a face, likely to the amusement of supervising runturred orcs. A thankless task, your lot in life, the bottom of the pile, but part of the orc ecosystem and an essential one. Yet snotlings can also take on a more proactive role. While individually in battle they may be quite literally useless, as with much that is orc, strength in numbers is the name of the game. Snotlings can either spread through an area like a green wave, suffocating anything that falls beneath its sweeping tide, or they may even deliberately sacrifice themselves by crawling into enemy weapons and machinery to literally clog them with the dead. Only Tyranids have been seen to also exhibit this kind of behaviour to silence Imperial batteries. They can also be used as quite literal fodder, wasting enemy ammunition or just as a distraction. And finally, Snotlings can even be used themselves as an especially unpleasant living ammunition. Shock attack guns use a narrow beam or force field to essentially teleport matter through the warp over very short distances, usually invisible range. And Snotlings are the only orc creatures not to be smart enough to understand the consequences of this. In the process, they are driven into mindless rages of being propelled through even a short space of the Immaterium with no protection. They then will be ported either inside an enemy vehicle, or worse, inside a target's armour, or even inside the living creature's own body. They'll materialise in a frenzy, immediately ripping and tearing and generally lashing out at whatever until they are either killed or die from ripping their own limbs and bodies apart in a mindless tantrum. Not to mention snots being fired through this nightmare weapon is said to materialise defecating uncontrollably. Such a terrifying process, they are quite literally shitting themselves. So for anybody, looking at you guardsmen, unlucky enough to have a raging snotling ported inside of them, the consequences are going to be traumatising. Mech boys or mechs are orcs who have a natural affinity for engineering, inventing and generally building orc machinery. This, as with orc surgical operations, have a somewhat if not fully improvised nature about them. While some mech creations are somehow fairly standard issue, for other things it often ends up being a matter of using whatever is to hand, and not significantly more complicated than just bolting X onto Y and willing it to work. Very much like the surgical experimentations some orcs end up being subjected to, a mech's technological experimentations may often end up being more deadly to those that they're operating on than they were to their actual intended targets. And this could involve some kind kind of extreme energy overload as a mech had bigger ideas than his machine was actually capable of tolerating, leading to horrific burns, or just its operator being fried alive, some overtly complicated machine with gears and just a general over-the-top sense of sharp mechanisms could easily lead to limbs being torn off of bodies or pulled in and mashed through, just honest to goodness segmentation by energy fields or attempted clumsy warp utilisation. Then again, the mech's odd creation of tech could prove too successful and become uncontrollable and become a literal loose cannon firing on anything as its operator loses the ability to keep it directed toward the enemy with any moderate sense of accuracy. As with most things, it's really hard to consider if an orc would be happy or unhappy about being obliterated by the creativity of their own kind, but you could pretty easily speculate that they wouldn't be best pleased of being robbed of the opportunity to gun down their foes with the excessively powerful and destructive mechanisms that the mech promise would be a sure thing. It can be one of those things which again, it could be a positive outcome for you, or it could be very, very negative. While much of studied orcs has shown them to enjoy surface dwelling to that of space or the skies, there are always those who buck the trends to take on specialised roles. And these are guys like the Flyboys, a subcategory of orc speed freaks, and they go beyond that of the surface speed addicts. The Flyboys need even further speed fueled gratification, and this speed addiction only drives them to demand more and more exhilaration and more extreme behaviour. While orcs do not have specifically designated kamikaze pilots, which you might assume easily that 
they would, the nearest thing to this is the Blitzer Bomber. Basically a dive bombing aircraft where pulling out of their dive at the last moment is generally the employed approach. This ends often with less than effective results where the pilot instead plows straight into the ground clouded by their addiction to go faster. And the result of this is often unintended kamikaze like effects. However, Orc bombers do contain a Gretchen based suicidal delivery system known as the Grot Bomb. These can be launched from a fighter bomber or also from ground based mobile systems. Unlike a standard dumb bomb, the Grot Bomb is more of a smart weapon, although the use of the word smart is not necessarily the best description. The Grot Bombs are basically a rocket aircraft with a warhead attached, and they have sensors to assist the Gretchen pilot to guide the bomb to their target, the end result usually being more accurately delivered devastation. The Gretchen are then inevitably vaporised on impact, and despite the surety of death, there never seems to be any shortage of volunteers for the role of being a Grot pilot. While being referred to by some as Orc slavers for their enslavement and subjugation of non-Orc lifeforms, they are more regularly the equivalent of Orc cat herders. These are the runt herds. Herein lies the subjective misery of their task, but again the positive duality of their role lies in the financial benefits for taking on this position few Orcs would wish for, benefits that are fairly substantial. The self-explanatory title of Runt Herder tells you everything you need to know. They are basically the overseers of Gretchen and Snotlings. An endlessly irritating and thankless task, and most annoyingly, a herder will likely spend more time whipping Gretchen and kicking Snotlings to get to their big gun positions than they will fighting themselves. As with all orcs though, these individuals play a critical role in orc society, because where most orcs have little patience for lesser forms, the runt herds somehow exhibit the rarest of orc traits, patience. This is rare among their own kind, but even less to have patience for the lower runt-like forms of the grots and snots. If it were not for this abnormal level of patience though, orcs would be continually slowing and inhibiting their own societal growth by too regularly casually ending those whose sole lot in life is to serve and provide the expansion for orc society. Still, patience as a description for runt herd is again not patience as we would envisage. It simply means that they're not going to rip off a Gretchen's head or break them in half just because they happen to do something slightly displeasing. Even more unusually, a herder will actually explain their duties to the lower forms and actively incentivize them. While the Gretchen and Snotlings live to serve, they still have opinions on their treatment and will only take so much abuse. Gretchen have been known to rebel and form exiled clans of their own when they felt that they were getting too raw of a deal in Orc townships. With all that said, a runted will with no qualms beat, batter and generally violently abuse the runts who disobey without a second thought. The best motivation is, after all, a proper good kick-in. Well-trained grots can be sold up to orcs, giving herders a regular and pretty substantial income of teeth in orc terms. Some runterds have even been known to train up snotlings to play a role similar to that of orc commandos. Just how this could be possible is one of the examples that almost anything is possible in orc culture. Some legendary runt masters have even created super grots and snots who have enhanced abilities through breeding and considerable patience in training. And so finally we come to the Rebel Gretchen. It's one thing to be the runts of Orc society, but at least you know your place. You know to keep in your lane. Yet some Gretchen have been known to buck this fairly established system, much to the disgust of all. It's not a common occurrence to be sure, but where it can happen once, it can happen again. And rebellion is a filthy, filthy word in the ranks of Orcs. Reactionary Grots formed a committee to object to their systematic exclusion from joining a WAG. Being forced to work their fingers to the bone but not participate in the big WAG? This was too much, and many Grots had had enough. When Gretchen revolt in numbers, filling their mech town streets with diminutive green skins, they marched to meet Orc leaders, who would on careful consideration as to what to do with these rebelling Grots, decided the best course of action was unsurprisingly to beat the living snot out of the Grots, punching and beating them with fist, rifle butts and many a head kicking. This was a fairly poorly but quite obviously chosen option for the Orcs, 
who now set off a chain reaction of raging grot retaliation. Shops and slops were entered and smashed up, but the orcs only briefly stunned by such an outlandishly rare uprising were more than happy to get in the mix and bang their bloody heads together, and much smashing, crushing, ripping and bleeding would follow. Some of the Gretchen would eventually surrender, but others instead chose a self-imposed exile to become rebel grots. Leaving the mech town, they'd walk for days to find a new home, and many would perish, and this only further embittered them to their former orc masters. Eventually, having found a new home and setting themselves up, these rebel grots are seen as some of the most despised by the orcs of a mech town. The rebel grots regularly will launch new raids to steal scrap, engage in sabotage, and generally sow discord. Their existence and ideology will usually bring new Gretchen recruits who are disillusioned by their orc masters. The Rebel Gretchen are fanatical about their campaign against the Masters that they feel gave them the right royal screw job. The Rebel Grots can also include Snotlings who are either captured before they know what's what or who just similarly run away. Any Grots who rebel in this manner are fairly unusual and a totally counterproductive force, and they have to surely be considered as one of the worst positions to occupy in Orc society wherever they may occur. Their tactics of sabotage, theft and even having been known to use captives as bargaining chips for ransoms or trades they're surely a much-hated and lowly faction of Orc culture. <laughs>